was a Nigerian centre back who come in. Tariba West. I watched Tariba West debut, mate, and that was the funniest thing I've ever fucking seen. He couldn't move. The only thing I can he say is I wasn't here when they signed him. As <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, you probably wouldn't have passed mate, the fitness test. Fucking. Did you see it? Did you? Did he was you a see great lad, mate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Was he yeah. a good lad? Yeah. He was a great lad. He, he was strange, strange was fella, he? mate. Wasn't his no, age, or was he? No chance. He was one of those, mate, you had a no, no, He was no about battle, 68, mate. mate. Yeah. He was honestly, he <laughs> he was a baller. He was good when he, but in his A day, right? So yeah, he was good in his day, yeah. but he come to Argo, yeah. mate. Like I said, these are all the stories, mate. It's like... <laughs> fucking it, mate. He seven, pa seven passports he had. <laughs> what? Seven passports. What, legit had seven passports? Yeah. <laughs> he had about six different wives. Carried his book round everywhere. Some of the stories, mate, Brighton away was incredible, really. I think Bobby Williamson was there then. Yeah, he was. I think it was one of his first ones. Bobby, Bobby Williamson. Oh, yeah, I remember Bobby Williamson. I feel like we need to just keep rolling with this, to be fair. Yeah. You're obviously doing a, a mental challenge at the moment, mate. You're uh, half marathons 50, and you're doing that for a particular reason, which we'll definitely talk about, but I can tell Danny's chomping a bit to hear these stories, mate. I think people would at home as well, mate, yeah. to be honest with you. I think if you're, if you're logging into this, you... Uh, yeah, you want to hear these, don't you? Yeah, so let's stick with it, mate. Tell us about, obviously, start wherever you want in your career, but obviously you're a physiotherapist in elite football. Um, I think you played as well, right? Yeah, left school, really. Probably youngest in my group, so all the local footballers you do, GGM and stuff like that. And a lot of us came through together, really. Uh, I started at Mayflower at sort of eight, nine years old. And some of that group went to Prince Rock End with a lot of youngsters. Mickey Evans, me and him were at school together, so obviously he went on and did what he's done in his career. For me, probably, personally, I say this quite a bit, is I think probably the best at Argo. Some look at it for different ways that he did play, but for me, without him in the side, he was incredible. So, yeah, we grew up as kids, went to Prince Rock, Ryan Cross, people like that, that all turned pro at Argo. Left school, signed an apprenticeship. Uh, who was manager then? Ken Brown was manager then. Uh, went through a few managers. Uh, John Gregory came in. And then Dave Kemp came in, um, who was pretty much been like a father figure to me right through football, really. Um, but he signed me as pro. Um, probably the field I eventually went back into, which is physio-wise, was appropriate for me because I was injured all the time. <laughs> and uh, got injured. Kemp, he offered me another year, but got sacked. Peter Shilton come in. I didn't play in front of him. And he, he kind of, at that period of time, got rid of a lot of the sort of fringy type players, reserve type players. Um, I think he wiped out about 12, 14 of that back end of the yeah. squad, took the squad a lot uh, smaller. And yeah, I played one game after it. By that time, he had sort of said everybody's on their way and that's it. Floated around Bristol City, Burnley, <clears throat> a few different clubs and then really sort of didn't know which way to go really. Football was all I knew. Um, and then my best mate Damien Davey was physio at Torquay at the time and just said right you need to get your butt in gear here and uh, do something so it was either the coaching manager and whatever it was or really physiotherapy really as I say I probably knew enough about injuries already <laughs> so uh, I did my sports therapy degree and um while well, I've been lucky all the way through, really, because the PFA really look after you during those periods. So everything I've been able to do was sort of part time, which was good because I was able to work at the same time. Um, so sort of a friend of mine was at Aberdeen. So I went up there for a few months um, and then his brother-in-law was physio at Millwall. So then went there for two and a half years then um, did my physiotherapy then uh, while I was there. And obviously the job came up. Kev Hodges was manager. Um, 99 I think that was and um, Norman Medhurst God bless him you know was there but it sort of retired and then and Hodgie was looking for somebody you know and thankfully that was the start of it again for another 10 and a half years then at Argo mm -hmm. um, it looked good success you know um, didn't work out for Hodgie at that time so then Stoic came in and that really was the beginning of five years of big success Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. 
Yeah, yeah. Stark was good when he went. Yeah, it was good. It was good. And, and we had a, we had two teams really during that period that both won the titles. Majority of it was based on team spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, I see that over the years here again where those lads were committed. The families came down. You know, Saturday nights we'd be out as couples or, or families or we'd be out as lads, you know, getting together. Um, the commitment from everybody then was, you know, lads from Scotland and Ireland and wherever, everybody came down. And that's, for me, why we, you know, we had some real competition with Joe Kinnears, Luton and Ian Holloway's QPR and stuff like that. But I think we had that edge to just literally overpower people because of the spirit we had, really. And that's really what made them successful there. You know, we had two good league titles and... Um, yeah, from there, really, Tony Pulis came in with Kempe again. And um, the way it sort of ended at that time with Argo was I wasn't really happy with. Um, it wasn't done in the right way. Um, I think they kind of knew, you know, Tony wanted me at Stoke when he left. Um, I'd stayed with Ollie, who I had a great time with. Um, and then, you know... I haven't really ever gone into too much detail with it, but um, it was an awkward period during then. I just signed a three-year contract and then various things were going on at the club and new directors came in, new chairmen's come in. So how does that affect you though as a physio? Does it just, they would just kind of, you see it with backroom staff, don't you? They just kind of want their own people. They just come in and they want their own people. Yeah, I mean then, you know, there was a lot going on in the football club anyway. The World Cup bids were in and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, and, that. Um, yeah, it wasn't done right. Um, I think in the aftermath of that, a lot of people have apologised to me for that period of time. You know, that was 18 years I'd give a football club. It wasn't done properly. Um, lots of bits were mentioned and stuff like that because nobody really knew. I didn't even know myself, if I'm honest with you. But um, So then I moved to, to Stoke with Tony. Um, we had a lot of success there then in the Premier League, which included FA Cup final, Europa League. So you was a physio when they when they done all that with with. Peter so Stoke. when I went to Stoke, yeah. So I was head of physio and performance up there. So yeah, Fucking we hell. had some good years up there. Um, as I say, we lost wow. to Man City in the FA Cup final. That would have been two thousand and eleven, the FA Cup final. That got us in the Europa League, which was that Roy De La- Roy De La- Yeah, was... Roy was there at the time. Fucking yeah, we had a good side. Was, you know, what, I, I listened to a. Uh, uh, Peter Crouch talking about that team. Yeah, Crouchy was there Crouchy, with us. Yeah, and he was talking about fucking. He said they were just they. You train in the middle of the pitch oh, yeah. before a match day to turf up the pitch before the good teams come down. They grow the grass longer so that the players can play as well, and they play long ball. And it was just mate that it's got to be one of the best fucking tactics ever. I remember Pulis was saying that you're all fucking average players, but you're in a good fucking system. It was. <laughs> it was. It was as simple that. I mean, my warm-ups, the amount of times I got grief from a warm-up, if I didn't, we played Chelsea away and it, it hammered down. And he went, if you don't do the warm-up in that centre circle, you ain't doing them again. And I mean, me and Tom were really close. We're good mates. Yeah. But, you know, you knew you had to work underneath him. And, yeah. you know, when it was game day, it was game day. And that's probably where, as you was talking about, with regards to, I can remember cutting it up. And, and the ground staff, they give me so much. I mean, it was like, they were so bad. We were just laughing, really. And, of course, Chelsea then couldn't play. Couldn't play for the middle. I think we might have nicked the draw that day as well. But it was those type of things. And at home... Mate, that seems legendary, though, isn't it? Because everyone yeah, says you don't want to go away <laughs> away to Stoke on a Thursday evening. That's fucking legendary, isn't it? You know? Yeah, a hell of a side. You yeah, know, Rob Ooth, yeah. Ryan Shawcross, centre-halves. I forgot about fucking Robert Ooth. He was you had Glenn huge, Whelan man. in the middle, Rory in the middle. You had Crouchy, John Walters, Matty Effrington, Jermaine Pennant. You know, we were flying. And yeah. at one stage... Um, in the was it the last season? I can't remember. I think we were seventh in the league on Boxing Day. Right. I think we beat Liverpool three 0 uh, three one at home. Suarez scored for them, and we were seventh. And then we picked up a couple of injuries. Matty Effrington, Jermaine Pennant got injured, and didn't really. Jermaine struggled a little bit from then afterwards for various things, you know, partly injury and stuff like that. And we never hit the ground running. And I think we only scored, uh, I think we only got about eight points from there on in. But I genuinely think if we had had that little bit of luck on a few different things, 
I think we'd have probably snuck in that top four that year. And that's how good, again, team spirit was a lot of it. Tom built that on it. The lads were great lads. I mean, every one of them were good lads, really. Right. And as I say, we should have won the FA Cup final. You know, we've had, we've had a good opportunity and they went down the other end, Torre scored the winner. And then we had Valencia home and away. We had a tough group in the Europa League. Dynamo Kiev, they had Shevchenko at the time. Yeah, I remember, yeah. Um, Maccabi Tel Aviv and Bizitskas, I think we had. And well, I think we joined top that group. We didn't lose, I don't think. And then we drew Valencia, we went on to win it. But again, the opportunity was there, really. I mean, I think we took five and a half thousand to Valencia. Yeah. Which, I mean, the fan base at Stoke are just incredible. Are they? Yeah, they're, they'd be right up there. I mean, the away support and the Argo fans, when they get going, would be up there you know, alongside it. But I think them, Leeds, when I've seen them travelling, Palace away was always noisy, you know, but the Stoke fans as well. When that Britannia got rocking, it was outrageous, outrageous. You know, away fans, probably I would go with Argo in, in Leeds to that degree, but as a home unit, Stoke, Palace, you know, they were places. A lot of people oh, talk about cool. Newcastle, but... You know, the times at Newcastle for me were more if they're doing well. Yeah, I, I, I've been St James's a couple of times. It's a bit flat sometimes. Yeah, it? it can be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Liverpool of old used to be like it. Get a bit of stick for saying that, by the way. <laughs> but I mean, when the brick got going, you know, the old-fashioned saying of on a on a rainy night, Tuesday, Tuesday at the Britannia. So. You know, if Arsene Wenger was coming that day, they knew what they were getting like. I, can't, I think United went there once and um, I can't remember the score, mate, but I remember it was fucking hammering it down, windy as fuck, and you just had Rory Delap like fucking launching these balls yeah, in. Yeah. And I remember sat home watching it going, we ain't getting a result here. There's no, you couldn't play football. You it was just a flat, I mean. Just, it was flat, it was like a cross, mate. Wasn't yeah, it? he was He was a javelin thrower as a kid. Was he? Yeah, he was. And I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he, he had damaged his shoulder at one point which somehow had almost like a dislocation type thing yeah. as a kid and it allowed him to get it but it was so flat There's, there was nothing you could really do it you look at England's the other day where it's kind of loop and get the flick on yeah his wasn't it was a, his was like a bullet coming across and you just couldn't cope and keepers if they knew they were coming I mean I remember one day me and Aidy Pennock who was one of the coaches so Tom used to get us as staff on a Friday to be the opposition on set pieces and stuff I used to love ending the ball as a, as a player Aidy Pennock was Captain Gillingham, Captain yeah. of Bournemouth and stuff like that. Would have loved that in the ball back then. And I can remember, we always talk about it now still, we were stood in the six-yard box just that they're being dummies, really, yeah. so to speak. And you'd look at it and you'd have Crouchy, Rob Oof, Ryan Shawcross, Kenwin Jones. Kenwin Jones. And I'm thinking to myself, how the hell would you ever win a header against these four? You know, it, they were massive. just so... It, it was just a total different era, really. Yeah. We come out at... at um, at Man City once and we were huge I mean we were a big old side you know and I can remember coming out and looking at them and going they're bigger than us you know you had um, I mean Joe Hart even for example but you had uh, uh, you had Nigel de Jong you had all the Tories you had well, yeah, yeah yeah it was massive wasn't it they were massive. huge uh, you had Dzeko up front you know, they were a massive was side. That, was that when, like, Micah Richards was right back? It would have been, yeah, it would have been. He's a big boy. Yeah, yeah big, big, I mean, big they boy. were huge. You know, I'm thinking, we're a big side, but they are massive as well. And they, and they were ballers. Yeah, <laughs> and they were top <laughs> they were as well. Because footballers are normally pretty small lads, isn't they? <sighs> I don't know. But at that time, at that time, you f I felt like it was more, not more physical, but it definitely... Different game back then, I guess, wasn't it? Yeah, a little bit. I think, yeah, I think so. I'd, I'd but you had, Joe, you had Joe exactly. Cole in... in Theo Walcott, they were still pretty much my size. Yeah, they were. They were yeah. And, and and you look at them on TV, and the, you know they're looking the smaller players. Yeah. But it was true, like you said earlier. Really, Tone turned a lot of players that would have probably had an average career into Premier League. Yeah. You know, Premier League players, and they jumped on that. They wanted to work for him. He gave them the opportunity. Do you think anything like that could happen again? I don't, I don't know with the money in it now. You know, the, the teams. It's hard to build a team like that now, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's probably always been a difficulty down here for managers and stuff like that, is the attraction has been the hard part. Yeah. You know, I think in years gone by, it was like senior pros who were maybe wanting to add a couple of years on down in the southwest and enjoy themselves. Yeah. Or if you get the youngsters a lot of the time in the lonies and stuff like that, it is difficult because 
partners may not want to move down here, families might not be, want to move down here, particularly if the security's not there, you know, if they're only coming for six months or 12 months or whatever. So you would understand that. But as I say, at the periods during the glory t t sort of years, they, everybody moved. You know, contracts were probably maybe a bit more. I don't know with regards to you getting three years so you're getting a bit more security. Maybe that has a bit of an effect on it. But I think the loan's always been difficult down here, purely based on the fact of... So far away. So far away. Yeah. And most lads want to get back to Manchester, or Liverpool, or London, or wherever it may be. It's fairly central, isn't it? Like all those places. Yeah, yeah. no airport down here doesn't help anymore either. Yeah, yeah. and if you're coming back on the bus and there's four lads on the bus, it's difficult to get a spirit then. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And football's changed. You know, you're not filling up the medical ice box now with 40 Stellas. <laughs> you're, uh, you know, now they're doing the oh, compression <laughs> garments and stuff like that. So, oh, Circling back a little bit, yeah. I've got to know about Tariba West, mate. Cause, yeah. So what, <laughs> so what was that all about then? So he, he signed kind of out of the blue, didn't he? Ran he did, yeah. Signing. Yeah, I wasn't here at the time he signed. Um, I don't know where I was on it. I might have been on the course, on one of the courses. Um, yeah, I mean, he was a fantastic bloke. I mean, I got on really well with him, but I mean, he was wild as they come. And I can remember Liverpool, I think at one point, looking to sign in for something like 11 million or something, because yeah. he had the World Cups, which were, yeah, yeah. which he had done well in. Yeah, he was just a character. I mean, <laughs> you know, whether he was 78 or 84 years old, I don't know. But, <laughs> but it was, um, yeah, it was a strange old period. Yeah, it was a weird time, wasn't it? It was a strange old period. Time. I think we had Rufus Brevet here at the time. Who was Rufus Brevet? Left back, came from West Ham. We had Nuno Mendes, I think, here oh, at yeah. centre halves. Um, yeah, I mean, it was... was... That, that, that little period, though, was based off of success, wasn't it? If you yeah. remember, you started doing well and then we started getting a, a, a couple of kind of names in yeah, and that's when it kind of went to shit. <laughs> yeah, I think Bobby had come in at that period, I think, when Luggy had gone... Um, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Bob come in there because I can remember playing Brighton away. But, I mean, Tariba was just as wild as they come. Lovely, lovely guy. Um, but, you know, he, he, he'd he come in to work in his regalia and he was, I can remember, Brighton away at the old ground. Yeah. And, um, I mean, in all honesty, it's probably the world. <laughs> The worst I've ever seen a performance in my life. <laughs> I think we only lost two 0 but we could have lost about fifteen nil. I think. Right. But yeah, it was. Um, we were all in the change rooms, and Tariba's come in, and he just told all the staff they need to get out. So, manager, assistant manager, all of us <laughs> lot. But he's coming and told you. All he's coming and told all us <laughs> you need to get out. So this is like ten minutes before the game starting. So we've gone into the toilets. So I'm thinking, what's he doing? Now, remember, each day I'm seeing him. You know, I'm in the change room each day. You know him. You know, I was a big, hopefully a big part of all that. So players could trust me, I could trust them. So I was involved in all the banter on a daily basis, you know. So I'm thinking, what's he doing now? So all of a sudden, he sits everybody down. Now, you've got lads in there, what's he, people like that, who are just desperate to go out there and, you know, stick 50-50s in and stuff like that. He's calming everyone down. Mm -hmm. He's got everybody sat in a circle. And then he starts, he gets his prayer book out and he starts preaching all the prayers to all the lads. And, I, and I'm poking my head around the corner, I'm going, I've got to watch this, I've got to watch this. I'm in tears, a couple of them's caught me, they're trying to hold themselves without pissing themselves, really. <laughs> and uh, he went on for about 10 minutes, the referee's knocking on the door for a minute, and he's, he won't, he didn't care who was around at that time, he's doing his bit. The lads are all itching to get out, and it's, you know, but nobody wanted to go against him because it's Tariba West, you know, I mean... <laughs> To be honest, I mean, he's still got a bit of a name, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of course he yeah, yeah. And uh, we went out there and got absolutely battered, absolutely battered. The lads are like, you know, half time, why are we doing this and why are we doing that and we didn't do that? And he, he was as wild as they come. One time, I think, he couldn't get in. We went to Austria pre-season. He had that many passports. I don't think he could get in the country, so he missed a bit, he missed pre-season. I don't know. I think he probably had about six wives, seven wives. I don't know. He was he was just as wild as they come. As wild as they come. But there was a few. Emil and Penza, he was another one. I remember Emil and Penza. He was yeah. another one. Yeah, yeah. he was a big name. He came in. He'd done all right initially, didn't he? Was that well, I think he only played right? about seven minutes of football, I think. Well, he, was a, he was a striker that played, and he was all right. He, he scored a, I remember him scoring a couple of goals, but it might not have been Emil and Penza. Yeah, Emil was a wild one as well. I think Luggy brought a lot of it up in his book, I think. 
that uh, he was just one of them. You, you know, you, I think he come to the club at about fourteen stone, and you just couldn't get it down again. It was one of them. <laughs> it was one of them that probably came just to really probably get, get a, a contract quid, somewhere, and that was it. And, and I know he was on a few right. quid, so it was like, yeah, he was a big name at the time, wasn't he? He yeah, he was, yeah. He was, there was some, there was some wild times there. But again, that's what I think is hopefully gone a little bit. Is now the Plymouth's not looked at as oh, I'll go down there for a couple of years, end my career, and then you know sit by the seaside and that's it. So we just got Wazza, mate. We just got Wazza in. You know I got Wazza in. Oh, my, this is quite a funny story. She might listen to this, but she just cut her PT session short with me before we done this because she's going to go down home park and hopefully catch a picture with Waza. I said, what are you going to do? Lack in the fucking bushes. She was like, yeah, pretty much. He's just one of your clients. Yeah. <laughs> he's been everywhere. He's been in the free crimes. <laughs> he's been down Seco. Yeah. That's what she said. That's Which is exactly good. She, I said. Mean, she said he's, he's been down Seco lane. Just said, what, are you going to start hanging around down there as well? She said, well, I might do. Yeah, there's a load, <laughs> the, there's loads outside the training. Getting do you know what? Uh, and it'll last for a bit. It will last for a bit. As, as a joke, I give her one of our uh, podcast cards. Nice. And I said, look, you give him this, right? And you tell him to get on the fucking podcast. And yeah. she was like, yeah, well, yeah, well. You'll probably get him on. Yeah, I reckon. You could easily get him on. Oh, mate. Yeah, you could easily get him on. We have no idea who this guy is, but he sounds... What, Wayne Rooney? No. Oh, what is that you're talking about? When yeah, Wazza. Yeah, Wazza. Yeah, yeah. Wazza. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wayne, 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 he knows yeah. him well. He knows him well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're close. Yeah, close. I guess me and Waz. <laughs> fucking hell, mate. Oh, yeah, fucking hell. That's what she's on, doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, yeah. she's fucking like... That'd be amazing yeah. if you get them on. I've had a few people message me about that already, and I was like, obviously, we would love to. Yeah. Especially for me, as I said, I was a Glory fan back in the day, so... Mate, he was... It, for me, he, well, he's... The thing is, there is whether you'd have to go through the club yeah, to get yeah. it. Whether you get it. It's all. whether they would do it then. That's the mm. problem, but... He's, um, yeah, he's fucking, mate. He's, he's another stratosphere of fucking superstar isn't he you know he's the greatest ever fucking England player you know it's for me it's it's you all grew up watching you know what I mean he was and I hope it works I hope it does work I mean I hope people have been asking me every day at the minute and it's like <sighs> mate that Birmingham Birmingham job was a fucking yeah and the DC one over in, in, or, you know the one in America and you're just like I like listening to him I mean he talks brilliantly I think he, and he's going to get a chance. Part of me is like, you know, what's the club kind of getting out of it after the last pretty much debacle with, with Foster? It's a risk, I think, um, when you've got managers like, you know, Nigel Pearson, people like that, who, yeah, for me, probably I would have took, took because he can establish a club for three, four years, hopefully, in that Prem. You know, lads I've spoken to at Leicester when... He left and ran. Yeah, he come in and said, listen, it was pretty much him who ran. Yeah, got him to where they were. Got him into the, yeah. pre into the Prem and probably won that title, really. Yeah. Um, so I probably would have liked to send someone like that in there who would have stabilised the club a little bit more. But he's brought publicity, probably brought a bit of investment. And, you know, hopefully, you know, I've got right back injured. My daughter's into it massively. So last season we went, you know, a couple of away games in... Did you? Gone into it more and more up there last season. So this year, you know, we'll get to as many as we can again. And, um, yeah, hopefully he'll do well. I mean, just what we're talking about here. He's in and around the city. It's given the city a little bit of a buzz. Hopefully he'll get a little bit of time. I think the pressure's even more because of what's just happened. Um, so I hope he does get that period. And I hope he's as committed as, you know, what he was going to need to be. And it's... Of course, listen, I think you're blind if you're not thinking it's a stepping stone for him, but... Well, he wants to put his name out there, effectively. Yeah. He's, got to, he's got to have one one managerial position, which he does well. Argo's a good opportunity, in it? If he, if he fucking... Imagine he got Argo to the Prem. Imagine. I know... Oh, yeah, without a doubt. If, if he does that, that fuck me. That's like he's the made, danger at the minute from a fan base point of view of immediately going, oh, well, in two years, he's going to get us in the Prem. No, nah, I don't think he you, you've will. You've got to become a championship side for three, four years in order to, one, financially, and two, stabilise yourself yeah. there. Yeah, they need to. And if you start putting people on silly wages and then it doesn't go well and you get relegated, you're back into that phase of, oh, my God. Hopefully they've learnt from their past fucking, you know, shit that they've put themselves in, effectively. Which I think they have. They yeah. seem to be running it really well. It, is, it does seem really well run these yeah. days, doesn't it? Yeah, they, they, it's they just, you know, know a couple of appointments now haven't gone quite well, but... It's football, though, mate. It's always a gamble, isn't it? You never know. You know, even you get experienced managers in and they flop. You know what I mean? They go fucking somewhere. They do well one place. 
don't fit in another, you know, systems, players. But again, whatever. down here, you are that far away. For me, you have to build a team spirit. Yeah. And when you're getting loanies in and you're getting young, young lads in, they're not going to want to be hanging a down around here. You know, the, what I've always found really is you'll get four or five games out of them. Oh, I'm playing first team football, you know, I'm playing in the league. And then as it drifts in, they're driving down on a Monday morning or a Sunday night, pitch black, hammering down middle of November and December. Yeah, they think Fox Going back to Plymouth, you know, it's like... And they start to drop off. And I've seen it so many times in that lonely type situation. Do you think that really hinders that ability to build spirits? I wanted to ask you about that because obviously you mentioned that was so vital with Stoke. We've established that prayer books don't do it. So what is the secret ingredient to it, do you think? For down here, I think it's different than pretty much most clubs because everybody is here. Mm. When you're in Stoke, sometimes, or any London, I mean, in Millwall and stuff, one, you're finishing work early because people have got to get home. You know, some might have to get the train down to London, some might have to go from Stoke to Manchester or Stoke to Birmingham or wherever it may be. So that can be harder at times there. The thing that's really easy about Plymouth is you're all in the same city. It's like a fishbowl. Yeah. So it's there for you really to build that. The problems are your weekends is when there is away games, the majority will go off and see their families. So it's that keeping that spirit of being able to do that and get everybody on the bus on the way home, you know. And if your families are there, it makes a big difference. Um, we were probably a little bit of luck during that period as well. And you've got to give credit uh, credit to Stoic there that he got the lads who were prepared to do that. You know, he, he will have done his research on these lads, I would imagine, and known that, listen, if you come in, yes, we'll support you, we'll give you a free contract, whatever it would have been. But, but your family, in, your family need in, to come, yeah. come with it. So you think it's about pre-framing that commitment from them in the first place? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, kind of weaning out the ones who, oh, he is only coming down, he's at the end of his career. You know, is he going to be committed? You know, we have people like Barry Lewis who come down here. Baz would turn up every single game. You know, through the week, he'd be as wild as they come. But you knew he was there on a Saturday and he was part of the group and he was committed to... Yeah. pushing the club yeah, forward yeah. Um, so it's a fine line but for me it's easier down here because you're all in the same same area mm. you know you've got players shooting off left right and centre when you're sort of London or Midlands or whatever that's, that's tougher again that is tougher again but yeah we had one hell of a change room I mean from pretty much 2000 to 2006 pretty much that way it was just outrageous I mean, outrageous. I mean, you got any decent stories? Flipping out. How you can tell. <laughs> There's millions. It's just whether I'm going to have law, lawsuits on Monday morning. But I mean, when Holloway first come, I mean, he walked into the change room. I'll never forget his face, actually. I don't, he hadn't seen anything. Because our change room, which was the old one now, everybody had paper cuttings, new pa newspaper cuttings, magazine cuttings of whoever you look like. Now, you couldn't see anything else on the wall. So the whole wall was like cut up with cuttings and stuff like that. And Ollie's walked in and Ollie was a brilliant man manager, you know, it was good atmosphere. He brought Des Bolpen in, who was one of the funniest men I've ever met in life. So we had, a, we had a good group around us then. But Ollie was very much one of them, like, you know, you support each other. He didn't want to hear anyone throwing their arms up on the pitch or in training, you know, and wanted all that. So for him to see us sort of hammering the hell out of each other, I mean, you know, the change room was brutal at times. But as I say to everybody in life, it was, football made me what I am today. You know, people will tell you, I'll go as low as you can go. You know if someone's being serious or if somebody's, yeah. you know, the piss. having a bit of banter. And we all knew that. And there was no one in that change room who ever took offence. I mean, you know, David Friel, people like that. They learned so quickly when they cut. <laughs> I mean, him and Roman Larry were amazing. They were a massive part of the, the banter and the, the, the quality that was in that change room. But Ollie came in that day. I mean, it was everything. You know, Paul Watt and I had Stephen Hawkins pictures put everywhere and, oh, you know, you whatever man. it would be in... You know, Paul Connolly would have shell suits all over his, you know, I would have everything to do with it. Wherever there was a sad face, my picture would be up everywhere. Uh, Nick Chadwick, Nathan Lowndes, anything that was ginger, bang, it was going up. Paul Scholes, orange biscuits, Duracell <laughs> battery. I mean, the whole chain, David Friel, 
he had lost a finger. Kit Kat bars left everywhere, you know, <laughs> wrappers on walls, and you know, I mean, it was it, nobody took offence at anything. And obviously, the world's a different place now. Yeah. But you know, and, and when Ollie walked in, that changed you. But he knew what we had there because I remember the first thing he ever said to me because at that period of time, Tony sort of left and was trying to get me up to Stoke and stuff like that, and he was like, "Listen." I know what the spirit's like here. I know you're a big part of it. Because when we beat them, he wrote it in, a, in part of the... Um, he signed on a part of the book and he wrote it to me and sent it to me. And he said, I remember telling our players that when you... I think Freer or Mickey scored, I ran from our dugout and everyone had a pylon down in the corner. <laughs> and he said, I, I remember telling our, our players on the bench you know that's the type of morale they've got when even the staff in the physio are jumping down you know so I knew he recognised what our changing room was like and he obviously let it let it be as it was and you had big characters then at that period as Neil Joffrey you know Watsy was there Mickey Evans was there Dave Norris Paul Connolly you know this is this group that's meeting up for a reunion yeah. in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Nathan Lounge, Dave Barrowsford, Stuart Malcolm, David Roman, you know, Stevie Adams. You know, we throughout the years you've always you've always had a mixture of people in that change room, Ian Stonebridge, um, Kev Wills, people like that, you know, you had quiet ones, Lee Hodges, who was, you know, one of the funniest lads ever. But that quiet ones, they'd still come with us. You know, yeah. you had you had your other end of the scale and, and, and your Hasneys and your Watsies and stuff like that, and me. And then, but we would all stick together. And I think most man, well, all managers really, they knew that when we came in, when they came in, that don't disrupt that. Then Holloway leave pretty abruptly, if I remember rightly. Yeah, he went to Leicester, didn't he? Yeah, he I mean, up and it was one of them. It? Yeah, I think it was just timing. You know, I think I've spoken to him a few times over the years in. Anybody would do it, you know. It's the same as the Schumacher situation at the minute for me. You've got family, you've got kids. You know, there is no law to in football. It doesn't matter what you say, you can try and bring it in as much as you want. There isn't, by most people. Because if somebody's dang it, dangling £3 million on, on you, I've got two kids I want to support for the rest of my life. For me, a lot of the time, and Ollie probably would have admitted that at the time, it was timing more for him. He wasn't doing it untoward or anything. But you've got to be careful what you say. People kissing the badge... Uh, you're not going to be here in a year or two, mate. What yeah. are you kissing the badge for? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Managers, yeah. well, you know, I've got... I think that's what Royals fans are, isn't it? Of course Where it is. people like... Of course like it is. fucking uh, Brendan Rodgers was like it when he was selling. Yeah. You know, I'm fucking green blood and kissing badge yeah. and this and that. And as soon is. as Leicester's looked at him, fucking bang, gone. Like, you know what I mean? Which you're going to do. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, whatever job you're in, someone offers you a million pound more... You're going to go. I, th I think as well in football, it changes so quickly. So if they don't go, they miss that opportunity, then they start a fucking results change, mate, and then they're, then they're, they're worthless. You know what I mean? It's fucking so, it's so brutal. So brutal that you have to take those chances when they come up because if they don't, they're just fucked, isn't they? And, and as I say, it was... Oh, moved on to that. And obviously, he was a high-profile character. So again, brought good publicity to yeah, the club. Was, yeah. You know, but I mean, that team then, again, I think we were third in the league at that period with him and was that, sorry was that the team with like Bazaki Hamosi yeah. Ivan Blake, Blake fucking Hales, Hales Norris Capaldi yeah, Timar yeah Watsi <laughs> yeah I mean we were third at one point in the championship yeah I remember when he left I'm pretty sure we were sixth because in, in January so Ebanks to Wolves and Wolsey went to Hull I think Ebanks Blake went to Hull it was it was just that period where it was that January when it we was going doing well and it kind of like just fucking yeah, we were so so. I mean, two I or still three to this players. day say to lads, I, I genuinely think we'd have got in the prem that year. Yeah, I think so, mate. You were smart with that side. I mean, everyone. they were brilliant. They were, they were brilliant. brilliant. They were I brilliant. Was Zaki, mate, in that league. Yeah, that they were, season, they were good lads fucking again. Man. Again, that was a brilliant change room. New lads came yeah. in. They they blended right away into the. You know, you had the big characters in there. Has knees in what sees me. You know, you had big characters in there who welcomed people in, yeah. you know, stood back and recognised their characters. But, you know, we were having periods where Rory Fallon was there and we were doing hackers, you know, before the game. <laughs> I was like, well, listen, we need to get the spirit then. And we started doing hackers in the change room. And you could see Johan Folly. You know, we had players there who were like, the hell's going on in this change room? And then you had other ones. You got, you know, you got a new Kiwi 
screaming in your face before the game and and then you had other lads who were banging their head against the wall ready to go out you know and, and there was never conflict there you, you know both understood how the others was but yeah I mean that team under Ollie, we'd have pushed it there and um, yeah and I think it went down that's where for me then as a club it all changed in one way yeah it went it went it felt as a, even a fan then it felt like it went shit really fast yeah it felt like we were fucking flying like we were like we could get to the premier and then within a, like a flick of a switch we lost a gaffer best players we were left with fucking shit the morale seemed shit we, we ended up having shit. three players left and that was Lillian Nellis what a player oh, he was him. I was about to say Lillian was a I mean boy. one of the greatest lads ever I mean fantastic bloke again brilliant in the me he was a football manager legend I used to sign him all the time yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we had him Lee Hodges and what's he left and they got rid of them and for me I can remember having a conversation with Luggy on that we were flying back from Austria and for me at that period of time then we lost that final thing of being able to hold that change room as it was and you know I've said it many times the team became the, the change room become little cliques and individuals you know you had you know, and then obviously people started going on stupid money and that's really where the change came from I think really you know the two new directors came in and that's where really the football club changed I think for, for quite a long time and Hopefully now it's back on track where it was. But, yeah, I mean, those characters back then, you know, your Lillians and that, fantastic, really. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, good years, really, there. And obviously then from that, I moved to Stoke and then floated around, really, once Tone left there. Uh, probably one regret, I kind of got offered the Somerset cricket job. Um, was driving down and then Tone got the Palace job, Crystal Palace job. As it was, I didn't go to Palace. I ended up going with one of my good mates, A.D. Panic the Forest Green, and he was like, can you come here and help set us up and get the department set up? Uh, so that was pretty successful. I mean, again, I wasn't a big lover of the chairman there. Uh, <laughs> you know, for what we'd done for that club and what A.D. done, you know, we, we developed it, moved it forward massively, um, and A.D. wasn't treated great. I had left. Um, he wasn't treated great after that he took him to Wembley and got sacked the day before Wembley I think something yeah, like that, that. Was fucking like so that. yeah that wasn't great but I mean that's again that's football and um, yeah just floated then and ended up you know a bit of West Brom a bit of helped mate of mine Jermaine Easter asked me to help out at Bristol Rovers my head was pretty much out of the game come that time then uh, so I helped them for about a year drove to Bristol every day which killed me you drove to Bristol every day. Every day. Um, got promotion there. Again, at the end, had a little bit of a... Uh, um, again, I think my time was done there. It was becoming... Players were becoming a bit more hard work. You know, you had to put your arm around them. Mm. You know, it was a bit like, come on, mate, you know, you're the, you're the best football player out there. We need you. <laughs> Instead of any in chance of you livening up, you know, which is, yeah. you know, if you've got a bollocking in the past, mm. right, I'm going to show you. Now it's like, well, I'm going to retreat into a show. And, and I'm going to cry about it. I'm going to cry about it. Bad. So, yeah, so towards the end of that, you know, there was a, uh, there was a period. We played Carlisle, we lost 3-0. I mean, we got promotion, I think, by then, but I think they were going for the title or something. And a few things happened in the change rooms. And uh, that was really when I said, right, that's it nearly for me then. Mm -hmm. And then came back. You know, I was pretty much ready anyway. The girls had, I'd been away for six, seven years sort of thing, travelling up and down, yeah. drive up Manchester back three, two, three times a week. Made sure I'd get back for the girls and then bring in coming up. And it was just time then, really. And how hard is that on your like family life doing all that sort of stuff? Like yeah, you I mean, see, like you, obviously from a footballer, they always talk about footballers. But even you being staff for these professional clubs, does it have a big impact on your? Yeah, life? I mean, for me, it's a hundred times more difficult. I mean, players, you're pretty much finished at one o'clock. Maybe not nowadays so much, but you know, you were finished at one o'clock, probably late as two o'clock. You're done, you know. And even from a you know from a manager and assistant manager, 
you know, you'll be doing a lot through the day. Coaching-wise, you might get sent off to do, you know, some scouting or whatever. But from the medical department, the kit man, the fitness side of stuff, you're there all day, every day. You know, you're not really... I mean, particularly at the bigger clubs that are involved in Europe, you know, because you travel... You know, if you're playing... I mean, we were Europa League, so you travel on the Wednesday, you know, play on the Thursday, you're back on the Friday, you might have an away game, so you're away again on the Friday... You don't get back till late on the Saturday morning. You're in for treatment on Sunday morning. And you're back to work again on Monday morning. So, I mean... Yeah, that must be fucking Yeah, and I actually. mean, really from a medical perspective, times are changing, sports science has come in, but you're still at the bottom of that ladder, really. I, I still would say most football clubs, chairman, directors, yes, it's advanced a lot, but you're still the last to be thought about. You know, in my argument always was, listen, you know, if you've got a player on 10 grand a week and he's out for six weeks and you've got a physio that's taking six weeks to do it, or you can get a physio in that will get him back in two weeks, you've just saved 40, 40 grand. grand. Yeah. yeah. You know, now that department or that physio or that person pay him what he yeah, deserves. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's before. always been my argument on the fitness side or the, or the medical side. And the one person who should be technically the highest paid person is the kit man because he is there all hours all hours you know he gets looked after by the players you know to a certain level and he's included in a lot of stuff but I mean the, the kit people are, their, their hours are outrageous outrageous you know when you're home get home on, uh, from a bus journey they're getting the kit off. They're there till three in the morning still trying to separate socks and stuff like that. I find that mental though. It must be so weird. Imagine being in a Premier League changing room. You've got a kit man. I don't know what they're fucking paid, but on, with these blokes who are paid oh, no, 250 grand. I couldn't do it, mate. I couldn't do it. 250 grand sat there with them and just fucking like, I don't know what even what they're on. What are they on? 30 grand, 40 grand a year? Who's this? A, a kit man. man. Yeah, what are they yeah, on? Like I mean, 30, 40 yeah, grand a year? Lucky. If they're lucky. If they're lucky. I, I'm talking like I know what a Man City, City one was on 90 grand, but... Was it? He was on 90 grand, yeah. Fucking 90 grand. was that Man City, mate. Mate, the kit yeah, man's just signed 90 grand. Yeah. Fair play. I was like, what? Yeah, But the majority of them won't be, you know. And... um and as I say, they should be the hardest work. They should be the highest paid of all. Yeah. But so, yeah, I mean, it is from a staff perspective, it's massively, yeah. you know, on, on your family without a shadow of a doubt. Because you never thought of either, are you? Like you said, you're the last to be thought of. You know, you're like last to be thought of. And, yeah. and if I'm honest, for me personally, players have changed as well. Mm. You know, they don't want to work as hard. They don't want to. Yeah, I think that's people in general these days. Mate. It is. It yeah, is. yeah, it is. Tell us about some of the injuries that you saw, mate, because we obviously had Gary Sawyer on. He told us about T Mart's head injury. Yeah, that was obviously the worst Sam, one. Yeah, Samba obviously had drop jaw syndrome, which was pretty yeah. serious from what, what he said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, what was the worst injuries that you dealt with? Probably T Mart's on a pitch, probably was the worst. Mm. You know, I mean, I think it was about 20 odd thousand in there. And their Wolves club doctor, I got on pretty well with right throughout, really. We knew each other quite well. And I can remember him standing up and just literally, I mean, Ella Kobe was, they're both brutes, you know, they were both man mountains. And obviously, as they had flicked, gone and flicked the ball, they just smashed heads together. So I can remember Ella Kobe getting up and just literally shaking it off. And Timo got up and I can remember him stood up and then screamed out loud. So the crowd laughed. I mean, pretty much 20,000 people laughed. I've kind of, I'm out of my seat. I can see the docs out of his seat because we're both like, that looked bad. But we kind of halted because they both got up. And then as he screamed, the crowd laughed and he's just collapsed again. So literally, we were both flying on then. And I can remember getting to him, a bit of an error, oh, bit of an error in one way was... As I've gone into him, I can see this dent, literally, triangular dent in his forehead. And as I've gone over, he's coughed out the blood and the blood's come right out. Of course, it's hit me right straight on. But, yeah, I mean, he came to 02 millimeters, so you've got two plates at the front there. He, he went right through the first one, and the second one came within 0.02, I think, from puncturing into the brain. Sure. And that's how lucky he was then, really. I mean, the guy was a brute. I mean, again, a fantastic bloke, brilliant company. But to be fair to him, he came back, you know, it, it, was he quite the same? Probably he would admit not, which wouldn't so surprise you in that circumstances, yeah. do you know what I mean? But that was probably 
the worst one I can think of. Dave Wall had a horrific ankle injury at Barnet. Um, Dave's probably, I mean, Mick Heathcote, probably the toughest footballer players I've come across. Um, you would never think it with Dave or Mick, they're both the quietest characters ever, but they were absolute warriors. Um, I can remember running on to Dave, looking at his ankle. He's looking up at me, laughing his head off, going, I think I've done something, Max. <laughs> his ankle's literally bent in oh, half, twisted in some way. I think he had a triple fracture into his joint, which was terrible. But he's just stood there laughing, talking about whatever it was, just <laughs> making jokes and stuff like that. But Dave was tough. He also had, I mean, from a wound perspective, uh, look, he got a French trialist in who was an animal. We were on a top pitch of the training ground and um, he was just being a lunatic in training. So in, him and Dave Walls gone up for a header and he's, hey, I can't remember if it was an elbow or a head now, and he's done Dave in training. So Dave stayed down and I'm thinking, well, Dave don't stay down. So I've ran over to him and literally he ended up having, I think, 100, 137 stitches. He literally, he had split across his eyebrow and this bit had fell right down. Oh, fucking hell. This is in training ground. This is Dave. Wasn't saying anything. So he's looked up at me and this skin has just dropped down there. Oh, fuck you. So I'm like, Dave, I think you might need to go up and get this stitch, mate. <laughs> he's like, oh, Max, can you not strap it up? This was Dave. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, he ended up, I think he had something like 117 internal stitches and 30 on on the outside or whatever. And I'm sure two weeks, I think maybe, we played Exeter, massive derby, and uh, he played head strapped up. I mean, Dave, was he was on another level. Mickey Eiffel was a warrior just as a bloke and as a as a football player. Um, but Dave was about the toughest I've ever known, and those two injuries alone were probably right up there. Mm. Um, and then Timo was obviously with his head was probably the most serious, serious one. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, you have your you have your standard stuff. Craig Taylor had a bad ankle injury. What's he had his cruciates? You know, you've had loads of cruciates over the years. Um, but yeah, they would probably be my top three. Yeah. I think it made a good stead because my first game ever at Millwall was... Um, oh, I can't remember his first name, Carter, goalkeeper. Um, he had a massive slice through his knee. Uh, at the den so I always actually enjoyed cuts Yeah, you know part of me was like cause I, you know I helped Scott Dan out a lot and I thought oh, I might get into boxing yeah I quite yeah. like that <laughs> seeing yeah, these yeah. big cuts because you knew once you got experience telling them you're like well that's okay it's not going to bleed yeah it's dropped up stick it together and that's it and where you go but I quite enjoyed cuts but mm. but Dave's was on another level like yeah, it was on nasty. another level and to play two weeks later against Exeter yeah so I told you what character he was like. Yeah, slept, slept with one eye open constantly. <laughs> Horrific on the bus. Scare any kid for the rest of their life. You should travel <laughs> home, Dave would be asleep like that. So what do you mean? Like, everyone would be talking to him. I guess where it's stitched back yeah. off, it's going to fall, isn't it? No, this was in general. Oh, OK. Oh, this <laughs> one, this <laughs> one after the injury. Okay. This was in general. <laughs> I mean, I still slate him now for it. What do you mean? You'd he be actually... like that, he'd have his eye open like that. What, asleep? Yeah. So you'd be talking to him, and you just think he wasn't answering you until you knew what he was doing, but he'd be, he'd be asleep like that. He actually would sleep with his arm, one eye open. And I used to, because I used to sit right opposite him, really, and we'd be playing cards or whatever. And uh, I'd be just talking to him. And for quite a few games, I just thought he was just yearing me off in one way, but yeah, he was sleeping with one eye open. Fuck Strange yeah, I've never that. Great lad, great lad, great lad. And mate, what, why did you wear two different colour gloves and boots? I think it's just me being me, probably. <laughs> just be a bit different. Yeah, probably, you know. Did used to work, though, didn't it? Used to stand out. Yeah, it did, yeah. I mean, it brought a bit of banter to the change room and stuff like that. It brought a few things over the years, you know, with the away teams and stuff like that. At the end of the day, I was a physio, do you know what I mean? But I think with the playing background as well, you know, I can certainly give banter back. And um, it just became a thing then. Mm. Um, I was about to do a thing on Soccer AM and then uh, I can't remember what he was called we were going to do a dance off <laughs> and uh, I think you've had Toby in here have you had Toby from Street Factory in here yeah yeah Toby Gordon yeah. yeah 
So till I ended up going to the till for three months doing some street dance. <laughs> what to I, do this fucking? Because I was supposed off. to go on and have a dance off for Baby Elvis. I think it was back then. Yeah. And um, so I ended up going with Till and learning some dance routines <laughs> to go on there. And we were going to have a dance off. As it was, I think he broke his ankle. This Baby Elvis guy. So it didn't ever happen. But we started doing me, Jamie Mackey, and Gary Sawyer. We started doing this comedy sketch, and it went on a few times on the Saturday morning on the soccer. Oh, yeah, mate. Like, soccer AM back in the day was fucking unbelievable. It was brilliant. It was, it was brilliant. like the best. Yeah. I used to get up, like, it, like it was, it's one of the only programs as a teenager I'd get up and I'd religiously watch. Yeah. I'd be like, fucking yeah, it soccer. Yeah, it was brilliant. Like, tubes and fucking. It was. And we were doing this comedy sketch, so each, each week, you know, I'd be sitting in the toilet, but I would come out as Elvis because we were going to have his Elvis dance off. So, uh, me old dear made me this big Elvis suit and stuff like that. So, a couple of scenes with like Gary and Jay would be having a in the toilet having a wee and I'd come out of the toilet it'd be all Tommy Cooper jokes that type of stuff really but when I used to go to away games with the gloves in the in the in the, um, the boots and that you the big as we went up the leagues the bigger players would be a bit like I can remember Don Hutchinson giving me giving me as I was going out going mate you're just a physio blah, 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 and tried to pop a palm me off and me being me, I was like, listen, it's the only thing I can find on your missus is floor this morning. <laughs> and it, 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 most players would get it, you know. He went mental. Did he? Yeah, he went mental. <laughs> he went mental. I've never seen him I've since. I never understand actually, that but, shit. Though. But, I, you know, I mean, I, I would have gone to town. I would have probably said a lot more than that. But, but I had that ability to do it, fortunately. And, you know, lads knew what I was like. I mean, I would rip the hell out of people, you know. But I think where managers kind of understood me I was always a player's physio, really. You know, being a player through year, an era where, you know, as an apprentice, I was stripped naked, put in a boot box and wheeled over to the fair, where the life centre is now. You know, pros oh, yeah. st stuck me in, stripped me naked, put me in a, a metal container, stuck me over there. I can remember being in there, I fell asleep for about two or three hours because no one was around. And I'm banging <laughs> to get out. In the end, I just fell asleep, waiting for the fair to open. Eventually the fair's open, someone's opened the lock. I've got it. I've had to push the fair, push it back. Fair's full. I'm pushing back. Everyone else has gone up. So you're in an era then when loads of that was going on, yeah. you know. And obviously times have changed massively. Do you think you'd but get we away had a change with room it? like that? You wouldn't. Would, I mean, would, you, would you get away with any of that? Sort of not shit, a no. chance on earth. Not a no. chance on earth. You know. I mean, it's fucking the sad, things that go on in change it? rooms. You know, it was it was outrageous, really. But it's again, it's what made our change room like it was. You know, and players kind of knew that. And managers knew it, really. You know, they knew I would be me in the change room. But they also knew if you were a minute late, you know, if I went out on a beer on a Tuesday night with the lads or whatever, and they turned up at 9 or 1 or 8 or 1, whatever it was on the Wednesday, I'm on them. I don't care. You know, and a lot of players understood it. Some took time to do it. Nathan Lowndes, one of, you know, very good friend of mine, he couldn't understand it initially. He was like, well, we were out last night. I went, that's last night. You're in now. You're working. Let's go. You know, like pretty much most of my closest mates in football, I'd have had proper Barneys with, you know, in change rooms. Um, because it was like, no, you're working. And that's where I think managers kind of knew it. And I know Tone kind of picked up on that. We had his son, Anthony Pulis, with us at one period. And obviously years afterwards, I think he would almost be saying to Tone, listen, Max is Maxi, but the lads are working. You know, when they're in, they're in, and he's on them. And I think that's where managers then allowed me to kind of be that sort of go-between. And at the end of the day, as a, as a physio, in, particularly in football, and I find it now, you're pretty much a counsellor, really. Yeah. You know, lads would come in, and, and, and if you never had their trust, you were knackered. There's no point being at a football club. And I used to say that to managers, listen, you know, I'll just be honest, you know, if I don't think he's fit to play, he's not playing. If he is fit, he's playing. It's up to you two whether you want to play. And when Tom first came to the club, you know, he, he proper tested me for two or three weeks. Um, and he tested players around me to see how I would react with that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of their, them where, you know, many times players would come in with personal issues and stuff like that. And you've got to be able to bond with them to do it. And if you didn't, there was no point being in the change room as a physio, mm. you know, to try and then get them out and, and run the nuts off. It's weird, isn't it? How, 
you have to bridge that gap in it. You're not just a physio, you're kind of like yeah, you're emotional counselor. support. Yeah, without a doubt. Like, yeah, like, without a doubt. Sorted. But yeah, I mean, yeah, f- the, the banter back in the, in the days was, it was brutal. Mm. I mean, as, as apprentices and as, as young pros, you know, <laughs> you know, there used to be a whole communal bath back then. You know, it used to be the big square bath in the change rooms. I mean, we still talk about it now. And it made, it made us the characters that we are. You know, you'd be you'd be sat in the bath and you know, it'd be five or six of you in the bath and then all of a sudden someone's had a shit in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's jumping out the bath. <laughs> you know, there's there's contests going on and there's you know, and you're like I mean imagine that now. Mate, nothing you can say would surprise me, mate. I played it's, I played football locally. Exactly. Yeah. And you know what I mean? And it, it that was football back in the day. You know, you'll get it in the dock. You know, dockyard back in the day would have been certain ways things done to apprentices in 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 the military and stuff like that. You know, but it's weird, isn't it? Because I always think of it as like, it is it is it is it's like character building. It's weird. It's like the initiation. Like we all went through it. You know what I mean? And I think without that, I don't know. I just lose a bit of like, I don't know. Something. I think sometimes it? people get labelled. People I know have been labelled as certain things, sometimes a bully, some things like that. I've never come across a bully, technically, particularly in the Argo years. I've never come across anybody who's done anything nastily in those circumstances. You know, the way they put it across may not have been good. I would have got it, you know. But I think you've got to be able to have that character. You know, I would hammer apprentices, you know. Get in my room, pros were your first, blah, blah, blah. Two hours later, I'll be down in the changing room with them, having the banter, blah, blah, blah. They could get it. You know, sometimes certain characters in the changing room, they weren't able to, they, they were trying to be banter. You know, they'd have a shit in someone's shoe or something like that. <laughs> but it would come across as, you know, bullying or something like that. It never was, you know. But as times changed, people started to say, well, that's bullying. It's like, no, it's not. That was just the way we were character building. You know, it sounds crazy to say it now, but it was it was how it was how life was then. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's not even that long ago. No, yeah, it's yeah, not. You're talking. And like, we won two league titles talk, doing it. I was about to say you're talking as if it's like loads. It feels like it's fucking five minutes ago, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Like you, you're only talking early twenty, you know, twenty tens. You know, it's, like it's fucking only fourteen, fifteen years ago. Yeah, feels like we're talking about something that's fifty years ago. Yeah. You know, and it's not. It's just. Uh, woke culture now yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't yeah, can't do anything masculine you can't be a knob you can't do this you can't do that because else you get fucking cancelled yeah that's the problem that is the problem and mate what was your uh, if you could think back and pick one moment that was like your career high what would it be yeah I get, I, I, I get asked it a lot and the QPR game was probably I've always said the QPR game when we won the league in 2004 which is what this get together is about but obviously the FA Cup final I would actually probably say the semi-final was probably better because it was the first time for me to be involved in something like that um, and we beat Bolton 5-0 in the semi-final so that was probably actually a better time than the actual final because you've already experienced it that's why I don't think the FA Cup final semi-final should be at Wembley but you'd already experienced that high so the final just didn't quite have that edge and obviously we lost it. So that would be in there. Um, the Europa League, obviously, you know, away in Valencia, that was a big high um, to think you would be involved in that type yeah, of competition. Yeah, the Mastala. The African Nations probably would be on a par with that QPR game, I expect, because major tournament, Big, big names, you know, the Ghana side had Thomas Party, both IU brothers, Christian Atsu. Um, what was it, sorry? You, you were... So I went away with Ghana to do the African Nations. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so that was 2019. What, with, with all them lot there? Yeah, so Fucking literally hell. Journal Samba, who a good friend of mine, who was at Argo, he's a big agent now, and he just rang me on a Sunday and said, listen, Max, we need a fitness coach out here. Can you get out here on Tuesday? So they were doing a 10-day thing in Dubai. So I was, you know, he was like, we'll look after you. I was like, yep, all right, let's go. So flew me out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm expecting, oh, God, it's going to be big time Charlie's, you know. The corruption out there is horrific. Oh, no, you know, I was blah, about blah, to blah. say, yeah. So everyone's like, mate, make sure you get paid before you go out there. I'm like, right, all right. So I go out there and I tell you, they were fantastic. As a group, they were brilliant, you know. The only real one who was slightly difficult was Jordan Ayew. Was he? Yeah, he was a little. He, he was. He was a nice lad, bit moody, bit kind of, 
Premier E type of thing. His brother Andre was fantastic. Uh, Andre was so good. At yeah, one point, he, really. he was a lovely, Fucking lovely guy, brilliant guy. They were all brilliant. I mean, George was good as gold. Just a little bit, you know, needing to kick up the ass sometimes. But um, fantastic group, and uh, I mean, I don't think they've won it for thirty odd years. I can kind of work out why, but it's. Um, yeah, so we trained out there. It was like nine o'clock training, still in thirty-eight degrees heat, and we had the tournament then down in in. Um, what was that experience like though, out in Africa doing that? That must have been. Cause yeah, you, I mean, you have it, this preconception, don't you? That yeah. it is fucking wild out yeah. there. Is it as wild as it looks? Yeah, it, it, it is. Yeah, you know, you can tell really, it's chaotic more than anything. Yeah, you know, and they are probably the team with the most group of famous players so to speak you know you'll have Salah and Mane and all that in drips in other teams mm. but pretty much eight or nine of them were big players Juventus whatever it may have been um, and uh, I was expecting a lot and when I got there they were brilliant you know really welcome the atmosphere I mean I've got loads of videos music everywhere you know you had the old boys on the drums wherever they went at training on the yeah. bus home to training on the way to matches <laughs> in the change rooms you know in the corridors you know we were cut off from everybody really in these five star hotels and um, it, the, the atmosphere was incredible incredible every how, time how did, get, did you, how did you get how did you get on we lost to Tunisia again I don't think the referees liked Ghana because I think they brought up the corruption with referees whatever years before um and I think we had somebody sent off after about four minutes for just moving the ball and letting the keeper take it. So we were 10 men quite early. We should have beat them, you know. And um, they lost to them. I think it was the last 16 that was something. But again, I don't think they've won it for such a long time. It is an eye-opener. You know, within three days, I can remember waking up about three in the morning going, what, what is that? I've already been here a couple of days. What's that noise now? They were at a training camp, yeah, about for a major tournament. So I'm opening up a door. Oh my God. They're on, they're playing cards, red stripe bottles of red stripe everywhere. <laughs> you know, brass walking here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh, am I on another planet? This is a major tournament coming on here. And you're like, right, if I was at a club, I'd be on them like a shot. You're here for a month, mate. They're going to tell you where to go, I expect. Yeah. Just get involved. <laughs> so a week later, I'm in the I'm in the corridor. <laughs> That's what I mean. Get to know. And a couple of bottles, of bottles of red stripe. But yeah, it was um, it was fantastic. I mean, a fantastic atmosphere. Hopefully, I mean, I speak to Journal quite a bit, so um, there'll be more on that side. But so that would be right up there as an event, hundred percent. Cool. I didn't, I didn't realise you'd done that. That's yeah, really that, that, was, cool, that was brilliant. Really cool. But as a game, that QPR game will take some beating. Yeah. I mean, full out at Home Park, you know, brilliant group of lads, you know, a tough campaign that was. And there was just something about that day that I yeah, don't think much, really yeah. can be topped. I mean, it was that much. Me and Mickey Evans, we went back to his house. We were all supposed to meet up like a couple of hours later and go on it, which we did. But me and him just literally fell asleep. You know, we'd gone from right up there yeah. to literally fell asleep for about an hour. We were planning on going back there getting smashed and <laughs> we ended up just falling asleep for an hour. So that would probably be, from a game perspective, mm. the Ghana situation probably collectively yeah. was probably the biggest experience. Really. Yeah, nice, mate. And one other question. When you ran on the pitch of Real Madrid, did you get a shot? I did, mate. Yeah? How do you two know? <laughs> <laughs> it might be made for another podcast, mate. I remember watching it, yeah, mate. I mean, but again... For me, you know, lads, I'd say it. I've still always thought, oh yeah, I'm a bit of a player still. You know, I could, I, I, I should still be playing instead of you and all that. Apparently, type of a little stuff, bit like more about the game than usual, right? It was, yeah. I mean, as a, to be honest, Madrid were awful that day. You know, they were spitting on our lads. Were they? They were terrible. Yeah, I mean, John Woodgate come with us at Stoke, and I remember saying to him, I said, "You lot," He's, and John, he said, "Mate." I was disgusted on that day. And I can remember him, I think, speaking to Haz or something and saying, listen, mate, I'm sorry. But they were awful to, to our lads because we were playing really well against them. But I know a few of the lads were like, oh, he spat at me and all like that. But then we had the big thunderstorm and Capello was an absolute asshole, if I'm honest with you. You know, he him and Ollie. always comes across as a fucking Yeah, cock, I mean, him he? and Ollie. Ollie was 
being Ollie sort of thing, but he dismissed everything about the day, really. And, um, yeah, so, as, as probably Gaz said, Oji was sat next to me. I was like, mate, I need a shirt. He was like, oh, man. And Oji didn't care about anything. He most laid-back man ever. So, literally, I said, give your shirt. So he was like, what? I said, give your shirt and your pads. A couple of minutes left. Now, if anybody had gone and done injured, I probably had even forgot about them. I was this more focused <laughs> on getting... I, I'm, it was Gooty's shirt, I think I got. Did you? Yeah, it was Gooty's shirt. So, of course, I'm spraying the water on. The lads are crying. I'm spraying water on me, getting my hair back, blah, blah, blah. I stuck my pads down the shirt, top off. <laughs> I think it was hammering down anyway. And literally, as that whistle's gone, they're like, Max, you can't do that. I'm like, yeah, I can. Literally flying on, got to the tunnel. <sighs> what up, mate? What up, mate? What up, mate? What up, mate? And I'm waiting for Gooty to come down. I'm like, well played, well played. He's like, yeah, well played, well played. Of course, that's it. I've got his shirt. Of course, I've ended up sweating you know whatever so I've got it in black pen got Gooty to sign it looks alright trying to get Capello to sign it eventually he signed it of course gone in I'm buzzing I've got this to come out from the shower because it had been wet and raining of course it's just a black blob of this signatures on it and it? that's it <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I'll give it to Haz after I'm pretty sure I'll give it to Hasney in the end <laughs> but yeah so I mean but that was again what we were all about, you know, they, they were brilliant for me. I mean, they I was must lucky. have been pissing themselves. So when they, yeah, you without fucking a doubt. Like I mean, I was lucky that. with the with with that group of players because they they let me be me, yeah. you know. In you are staff and they are players, but again, whether it was management or whether it was players, they kind of knew my character, mm. and you know, and they knew they would work if they were injured. In that, I would get them sorted if they were injured. And, you know, I was pretty much mates with pretty much everybody. You know, it was, we'd fall out. I mean, fall out on a daily basis. I'd come in most times, right, miserable get, you know, <clears throat> God rest his soul. Uh, Jack, Owie and Pierce, he always used to say to people, don't speak to him till about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And that was the case because for me, it was like, well, I have to have that side to me because we've, we've had a laugh. You're not going to respect me if I keep doing that. Once you're in, nine o'clock, bang, if you're late, I'm on you. And that's where, as I said before, it changed at a certain period. Yeah. We got different types of footballers in. And, um, you know, I can remember... You know, it, there, was some, there was some decent lads there around then, but there was a lot that I just couldn't connect to. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the time then when I wanted to get, not wanted to get out of there, but... It affected the way I was in there. I wasn't... I didn't really involve myself in the change room then so much <clears throat> because it wasn't the same characters for me. And I think that's where then I started getting more frustrated. Mm -hmm. The club was not doing well at that period of time. I then sort of had a few words with, with Luggy and stuff like that, and that relationship had kind of dispersed a little bit. And then, as I say, things weren't done well. Mm -hmm. Um knowing probably if they could get me out if I wanted to because the option was there for me to go to Stoke. Me being stubborn was like, no, but you know, in the <laughs> end you get forced in certain ways and that was it. But Yeah. And obviously it's sort of these days you, you kind of obviously out of football for the most part other than the opportunity working in private practice. Mm -hmm. How do you find that now? Because obviously you've just talked about obviously a long, you know, sort of amazing career with some really big highs and, and loads of banter and camaraderie. Like, how have you found sort of, I don't know, your head sort of working in private practice in isolation now without that team spirit? Yeah, I mean, it's took, it took time. I mean, I think I probably was ready at that period. I had a lot going on, you know, my personal life at that period of time, you know, uh, you know there's been some tough years. Um, when I was coming out of it, I'll probably look back now and maybe say I did have a little bit of a breakdown at that time. Um, just coming out of it, I had a big breakup in Manchester, and so that kind of affected me a lot. Coming out of the game, probably somewhere involved in that, was psychologically having an effect on me of where was I going to go with it. I knew I was going to start a clinic, but you have all those stresses with that. You know, it was pretty much from 15 years old, football was all I've ever known. Um, and then I've been back, I think I've come back in about 2017, I think, 16, 17. Um, so personally then, you know, my life was right up in the air. And um, 
that was part of the decision as well as everything that I knew was happening football-wise. And yeah, Chuck, it, it did take time. I mean, I think one thing I'll probably admit over the time was that because I'd always kind of been the wheel, I think particularly even at Stoke, it, it was difficult for me to sometimes, because I was sort of ahead of it all, I didn't like being, I don't think I ever liked being a cog in a wheel, so to speak, um, which I recognise a lot more now. I wanted that injury from when I start to when I finish. And as, particularly nowadays, as you go up, you're part of that team. You know, you're handing somebody over from the clinic-based stuff to the rehab stuff to the outfield-based stuff. I didn't like that because for me it was like, I know what I'm doing. If you don't think I'm good enough, fine, I'll move on. But I know what I'm doing. I want to take him from, I've seen that injury happen, I'm going to take it right to the end. So I think moving into the private practice, I was okay with it because it's all eyes on me, you, do you yeah, know what I mean? So, end, yeah. and, it, and if, I, if, if I had not got somebody back, I'll take responsibility for that, you know what I mean? So I think from that perspective, it suited me. Um, but now, personally, I mean, the journey I've kind of been on in the last couple of years, um, I think it suits me a lot more now because I prefer that one-on-one. -on -one. I'm seeing different people every single day. I'm trying to branch down into that counselling side a lot more. Um, and so I'm, I'm enjoying that more. I miss the banter. I mean, as I say, banter was all my life from 15 years old, you know, and I probably would say myself, I'm not sure there's many that would I banter me ever. <laughs> um, or go as low as I can go probably ever. <laughs> Nowadays, obviously, you have to change a little bit. But So I'll probably miss that side of it. The Saturday buzz, <clears throat> yeah, I'll miss the match day stuff. Um, I'd always kind of felt I would have liked to have gone into a bit of management type based stuff. That's probably a small little regret. There was a couple of opportunities I could have um, and didn't. So I'll probably that's what I would I miss that Saturday buzz. But from a clinic base, you're seeing different people every day. Um, you're getting people out of pain from some long-term stuff. So it was probably just about at the right time. Um, but as I say, you know, that was a toughish period for me anyway uh, during then. Um, and I don't think I would have been able to continue really. You know, the Bristol Rovers thing right at the end, it kind of all happened three quarters of the way into that. And I think really it probably if you know i'll be open to say it probably affected me a little bit during that i was driving to bristol every single day um so it will have definitely affected me then if i look back now um fortunately you know it got to pretty much the end you know and then i was able to get out and, and start to refocus and started doing a, a lot more study then on the neuro, neuroscience side of stuff mm. which is what's now brought me into trying and now go down the mental health side a lot as well so but yeah I mean it, it probably suits me now I've had a I've had quite a lot of offers since I've been out um footballers have changed as we've said already um traveling wise you know I'm older now I think it is more of a young person's arena for all the reasons we've said you know turning up late not having days off you know, you've got to be right on the ball with it and prepared to put it in now. Um, in my lifestyle now with different avenues I'm trying to branch into, it suits me as I am now, mm -hmm. you know, and I've just got a dog, so that takes up a lot of time anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, yes. yeah, it probably suits me now, probably yeah. suits me now. But, no, it was difficult. I mean, those those year or two right after I'd come out of it, I thought I was ready, I wasn't. They were tough. It was tough. It has been tough, but... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy where I am now, in, in where I'm trying to branch out. Yeah. I'm trying to branch out. Yeah, but, okay, um, mate. I enjoy the private practice. Yeah, good. And we mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast about, obviously, a challenge that you've recently set yourself. So tell us about the journey over the last few years and some of the training and, and that challenge and, and why you've kind of started doing that. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I had said to everybody, I wasn't a runner. You know, I was a sprinter. My pace was pretty much everything. I could block tackle with my head, head it, kick it. And I had pace, you know, don't give me the ball for too long because, you know, I'll lose it. So I was that type of player anyway. So the running for me wasn't something I'd ever, I mean, I'd 
sort of been gym really based from about when I first stopped playing really. Um, so from a cardiovascular point of view, I wasn't, I was always at the back with the goalkeepers or whatever, you know, if I was doing pre-season. So the running side of it wasn't really a, a thought I'd ever gone about. And then the last two years had been difficult. I had a breakup from somebody, which had been pretty long term and that had affected me. Um, I hadn't really ever stepped back. I was probably living in life since of coming out of it. I wouldn't say fantasy, but I would, I would be living a life that was, you know, sat going to football, having a drink, doing this, out weekends, doing this. And, and it's a life probably I'd only ever knew. And then I think when this happened, it was a bit of a wake-up call then. Um, and during those periods, I mean, I'd been studying neuroscience for quite a long time. It took me pretty much seven, eight years, really, because, again, I was fortunate how I could study it. But it was a saviour for me, really, back when all this first started, which would have been about 2016, I think. Um, and a couple of friends of mine, astrophysics guys and that, and so they were, it helped me. Technically, it saved me, really. Um, and that's kind of always been there for me to gather and gather and learn more and more and more. I've studied the brain a lot now. And that probably what helped me a lot a couple of years ago, although I didn't see it at the time, you know, I was still living that lifestyle. So then two years ago, obviously, you know, the breakup was a big part of it and, and different, a couple of other little bits. And I just said, right, you need to get yourself together. And where is it you want to go with this? And it was literally that decision to go, right, stop it. You know, the drinking was an issue. I never, it, but I would binge on a weekend if I was going out or whatever. And, and so it was a just case, right, you know, change your lifestyle, change your he eating, change your drinking, change what you're doing, surroundings. You know, I had been in, it, it was little moments where, you know, a friend of mine was swimming on the hoe every morning. So I started, that was where I first started, swimming every morning at Tinside. And it was amongst a group of people. I mean, I'm, I still do it now pretty much every day. That's a couple of years, just a fantastic group of people. And I think the biggest thing one day was where a lady had started talking to us and I think the football insider stuff, it, it wasn't rudeness or it wasn't ignorance or anything like that, but she was kind of trying to talk in, we were like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I got in the car and I was like, we actually haven't even really probably listened to her. You know, we've, we've got this, I suppose some would say it was a bit of an ego, but not in a, not in a horrible way, but it was like an ego of, mm, she's not really anything to do with us, so what does it matter? when actually I thought, well, she might be struggling today and she just wanted to talk to us. And we've kind of pretty much dismissed her. And we both were like, you know, he was an ex-player and we were both like, yeah, tomorrow we're going to have a good old yap with her. And this was pretty much in the first few days of me going up there. And it was, it was something that triggers me all the time now. We sat with her the next day and her life story was incredible. You know, she was quite eccentric, but it was like, we missed, we wouldn't have even known about that. And all of a sudden you find yourself caring about other people really in one way. Whereas I think in that football world, you do shut a lot of it off because you surround yourself with that group of people. Mm -hmm. And I think it was from then that I started, you know, little things started to, to creep in more and more and more and then discipline started to keep in. And then obviously changing the habit, changing the tape, you know, from the stuff I knew of, you know, from that side of stuff. And that's how it, first started and I you know the first thing for me which I'd say to a lot of people is the making the bed scenario of you know if you never ever bother to make making the bed it's uncomfortable to start making it eventually then it's uncomfortable to not make it and that's really where I try and say to people is that's how it changes you know it's a simple fact of oh, I can't be bothered to make me bed I can't bother to do this it doesn't matter it doesn't matter two whatever, 27, 37 days of whatever, doing it, oh, I haven't made my bed today. You know, I'll get out now, and whether I'm late or whatever, I'll still make that bed, because I know if I get in my car, I'll be uncomfortable that I haven't done it, and it would have been the opposite. And this is, you know, that's, you both know this yourselves, you, you know, from your backgrounds. That's as simple as you can break it down. The hard part is doing it yourself. We can all preach, we're all psychologists pretty much from our life experiences, but doing it yourself is a tough period. And so that began to build... And I was struggling, you know, in, in, with different bits. 
And then a year ago, it was one of them where I'm thinking, well, what can I do? You know, I want to start doing something to give me that motivation more and more. And then I turned 50 last July. There were probably some underlying agendas with me where, you know, I wanted to do stuff for different, you know, reasons or whatever. That may have helped other scenarios, but um, it became something then that I wanted to do for me and for other people. And that was it. I thought, right, so I'm turning 50. I'm not really a great runner, but I'd started running from a psychological point of view to help me out. And then I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and do 50 half marathons. And that was it. And then a few of the lads, the first one was at Padstow. So I did the Camel Trail sort of six and a half up, six and a half back. And it was a real, real emotional day. You know, I'll never forget it really because, you know, I've got about 30 in the group now, but it was me, before mates, all ex Argo players really. They stayed in the pub in Padstow, got absolutely <laughs> smashed out of their heads. Bumped into a couple of other guys there who were fantastic, who started the kind of donations. Or, But I can remember running that day and I think somehow everything came into me. And I can remember running that last three miles literally in tears. You know, everything had kind of caught up and I was kind of grasping, right, this is a challenge that I'm going to get to. And I think everything then over that short two or three years, really, it, it literally come out of me. And I think that was the start then. And then we went back and we, you know, it was my birthday weekend as well. So we went, and, you know, we had a festival the next day, but there's two guys in there who had been... John Chuck, he'd been fantastic throughout this. He, he's donated really well. And we were all talking about different stuff in, you know, it was almost one of them little men clubs, really, on that day. You know, five or six of us are sat there just in tears at one point, all talking about each other's lives. And from then on, it's obviously grown and grown. Ian Stonebridge, who's been fantastic, I mean, his missus, he came running, I think, from the second one or the third one. Um, he's been big support for all of this. Has he done most of them? I think, he, I mean, he does a lot of the ultra ones. I think him and his wife have got, um, I think they're doing an ultra marathon this weekend coming. So he, he jumps in and around there. But I reckon he must have done probably 26 to 30 of them, probably, I expect. He keeps himself fit, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I mean, he's a proper runner as well. I mean, yeah. he's one of them who can run all day. I don't know how old he is. I remember a few years ago, just before I stopped playing, he played a few games for us at Marjons. He was chucking in and playing yeah, yeah. playing centre half sometimes. Yeah, I don't know. But he was fucking fit as a fiddle still. I mean, a fantastic bloke. And what a player he was at the time as well. But he was that Stevie Adams of the side who pretty much was on the team sheet every week, but would go under the radar. But you knew when you didn't have him in the side. But yeah, so the support. I mean, the group I've got now have been. You know, you're talking about fuzzy and people like that. It's brilliant. We got around thirty come up there, and it's. I'm going to keep it going. I'm still trying to think of that next challenge. I've got a few things in my, in my head, but I've got a little Wednesday club now that runs. Um, what I've found with the thing on the Sunday, it's helping people in their own little way. You know, some are like, well, I was probably doing too much on a Friday and a Saturday at home and maybe doing this and doing that and drinking here and doing stuff like that. Now I know I have that focus on a Sunday. I know now I might have a couple on a Friday night, but that's me then. I know that's coming. And other different things, you know, it's got to be getting people out. As you know, things you're doing, you know, it's getting people to change their habit. And that's where really the change of tape came come from. You know, we are a series from zero to seven years old of recordings in our head. Whatever we experienced pretty much in that zero to seven, that's what we become. You know, we're, we're a product of those first seven years and whatever emotions come from that, they're the buttons that get pressed. Hey, and so I try and say to people, listen, your, your brain is a VHS, uh, VHS recorder, mm -hmm. which is going back, you know, and there's a series of tapes and that brain will just press that button now, depending on how you felt at the time for similar circumstances. And if we can change it, you can't, you can't control what's coming in Forty to 60,000 thoughts a day go through our head. You can't tell me all of those. So you're never going to stop the thoughts. You're not going to control them coming in, but you can change them when they do. The ones that you recognise throughout the day that are, you do, you are aware of, they're the ones you can change. And take that tape out, put another one in. Take it out, put it in. Take it out and keep repeating, repeating, repeating until not doing it becomes uncomfortable. We can all preach it. You know, each day I'm still trying to do mine, you know, from making the bed, as simple as something like that. But that's what it is. People think they can control it. 
a lot of the time, and it works for some, you know, I never dismiss anything, whether it's in the medical world or from, you know, the mental health side of stuff. Whatever works for that individual works. But you can't control them coming in. Some people are like, oh, I'll put it in a box or put it on a cloud and I'll push it away. Fantastic. If that's what works for you, that's amazing. But sometimes you can't control it. It's going to stay there and it's going to keep knocking on your brain. And I kind of say, well, if you have a puppy, it's going to keep scratching. If you walk in the room, it's going to keep scratching at your leg. No matter what you do, unless you pay it that attention for a brief second, it's going to keep scratching. When you do pay the attention, it will calm down. And I, a lot of the times, and it works for me more, is where I'll go, right, I'm going to set my alarm for two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, whatever. I'm going to let these thoughts come in, and I'm going to let my feelings come from that. And then I'm going to go, alarm's gone off, bang, that's it, gone now. So I think sometimes, you know, there's various ways you can do it. It's whatever works for that individual. But sometimes it's not better to just push them away. It's to allow, they're going to come in anyway. Allow them to come in, give them a bit of attention, and then from there go, right, okay, I'm putting you there now. Now I'm going to go on and do what I'm going to do. Because sometimes it does keep plugging away at the back of the head. But that's really where the change of tape came from. And it seems to have... It seems to have latched on quite well. You know, I'll have a lot of lads that are in the trades and I had one the other day and he said, you know, I've walked in on a load of lads in wherever they were. And they were all talking, change the tape, change the tape. And I was like, really? He said, I'm not sure really what you're doing, like you two guys are doing here. You don't sometimes recognise the effect it is having on other people. You know, I'm only a year into it and hopefully it builds and builds and we've got some ideas of where it's going to go, but... The biggest thing for me that I use for myself, and there's a lot of people that I talk to who are like it, I don't really have, I never, I am now, I never really look behind or what was down. My problem a lot of the time is I see what's at the top and I want to be there. And I want to be there quick. And when you have those drop-offs, you know, we're not perfect. When you do drop 10 metres... Oh, God, I'm never going to get there. So I kind of visualise myself on the mountain. And where I'm always thinking, I've got miles to go here, and if I have a bad day or a bad moment and I drop, I'm like, oh, I'm even further away. Well, what I try and then do is I'll look down now. Because you'll have people, oh, you're doing brilliantly. You know, look what you've done. This is amazing. Look who you've out there, look, whatever. You don't really take that on board because, for me, I'm still thinking, yeah, but, yeah, yeah but. Maybe they're exactly the same. Whereas if you actually look down and you go, oh, look at everyone down there cheering me on down there. That's miles away. You actually go, well, actually, I have come hell of a long way, haven't I? But the majority of the time we don't do that. Mm. And you've, that's the bit you've got to remind yourself of, of going, yeah, I know I've dropped 10 metres, but look, I'm still miles ahead here. Yeah. And that's, that's what I use a lot of the time. It's the one thought I go to now where I'm going, hang on, hang on, hang on. That critical brain will constantly keep tapping away give yourself three bits of evidence look look where you are well this is what you've done last week this is what look that person you've helped there keep giving that three bits of evidence to it and it does dampen that down but i visualize that mountain of going yeah okay it's the journey getting there that's what i've got to enjoy getting up there yeah i'm going to drop i might never get to that top bit but look how far away i am from that group down there who's cheering me on mm. telling me i'm doing this telling me i'm doing that yeah. and that's really what i I use as much as possible now. You know, there's a few other little things, yellow cars, you look for yellow cars, you're gonna see yellow cars. Yeah. Simple as that, you know, that's a fairly one that's commonly used. Yeah. But I think sometimes you have to look at what you have done. People say, don't look back. Yeah, look back. Look back, look down and see where you are and where you've come. Then that brain will go, mm, okay. Cause it's gonna keep criticizing you all the time. Yeah, I love that, mate. And. Uh, I haven't done it for a while, but going back a few years, I used to keep it. wasn't a gratification list, but it was like just a list of stuff that I'd done in that year. Yeah. And it could be anything big or small. And at the end of the year, I used to find because I operate on quite a sort of fast frequency. Yeah. It blurs. And sometimes I'll think back and I can't think of things that I've actually achieved. And I look at this list and it would be like massive. And again, lots of different things. So I think that's really powerful. Yeah. Have you ever seen the, um, the, the Life Trapeze Act? It's where the guy's walking up the steps and he yes. falls into uh, the trampoline yeah, yeah, and, keeps falling off, yeah. and tumbles. That's yeah. a brilliant analogy Fantastic. of life, I think. I love it that. Is. It I mean, is. He's done it live, didn't he? Did you see yeah, that? they did, We're yeah. Live yeah, it's the amazing to see. He's fucking nailed it, it by is. the way. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. There's loads of people yeah. there. But yeah, yeah no, that's no, brilliant. That's a great analogy. But it's so true, though, isn't it? It's so true. How much? How many times you try and drive forward and, you know, I feel like I've experienced it recently where you're just fucking like 
slogging away, slogging away, and then you feel like you're not getting anywhere, and then all of a sudden something happens or something changes, and you think, ah, you know what, I'm way further on than I was a year ago, way further on than I was two years ago, you know? And you just got to keep reminding yourself. Especially when you're trying to help others as well. Yeah. You forget yourself sometimes. You do forget yourself. You know, and I think everyone, the world's a different place. I mean, people are looking for things. I think COVID did have a massive effect on everybody. People are running, cycling, paddle boarding, swimming, sea swimming, whatever it is. There's groups growing up everywhere. So people are becoming more aware of it. You know, I'm, very much mental health side of stuff now but you know it, it does frustrate me at times you know there's there's a, a group that are poorly there's a group that are depressed there's a group in between that sometimes we're missing those two groups in my opinion because it can be used in the wrong terms you know sometimes you know it's so it's everywhere now that sometimes people aren't struggling it's a term that's put to it but they're just feeling down at this period of time you know when i do worry at times that'll hide the ones that are in depression because they don't really want to be classed into that field so they're going to back away even more and we maybe miss them people are poorly obviously you know they're getting the help they need so it's a fine line between making sure that we don't focus so much on stuff that can be dealt with in a simpler way and we do focus on the ones that we're going to miss um but you know because it is easy now you know it is easy to use the term uh, in a way that's not really you, you know you, you do see it sometimes where oh, i'm not feeling great in work blah 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 well we'll double your wages oh yeah no i'm okay now <laughs> and that's the ones you've got to be careful with and i see it you know in in oh, i've got you know mentally health and blah 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 uh, well, yeah, but if we do double your wages, are you coming back to work? Yeah, of course I will. Yeah, I'll be fine then. So it's about making sure the right people are getting the, the right help. But I think you, you know, the awareness of it now is brilliant. There's loads of stuff popping up. How do you, how do you feel about? Uh, I've been reading a lot of stuff lately about people over talking about their pro- talking about their problems too much, and then that they can't get out of that cycle of thinking a certain way. So, so manifesting it sometimes, yeah, isn't it? Like, That's 100%. You know, we would sit here and, and say we all opened up and had a conversation about it, but say we've done that every day, and then you think, God, my life is shit. My life is this way. My life, you know, and sometimes when I speak to people, or I, I speak to certain people when they're saying all the time that stuff's shit, it, you know, you get that person, you go, how oh, are you getting on, mate? And they go, oh, it's still shit. Oh, I was, it's still shit. And I think... Is it is it that shit or is it because you're in that cycle of just saying, yeah, shit, 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 all the time yeah. that then you believe that your life is that shit? But realistically, um, when, speaking to Sam and Frank, uh, our last guest we had on, Frank was an orphan in Cameroon and, and Sam adopted him. Now, Frank had nothing. So sometimes when people are saying, oh, my life's shit, when they've got a job and they've got this and they've got a nice house and they're sleeping in a nice bed and they're eating nice food and whatever else, then you speak to someone like Frank, he was selling rat meat on the fucking top of his head and had no parents. It's like, it's, it's you know, your life's actually not that shit. You might feel down at times, but I think you've got to project it in a better way. You've got to have positive people around you doing positive things rather than over-talking a situation. But a subconscious mind doesn't know what's real and what's not. It's listening to your every single word that comes out of your mouth. So whatever you're talking, the subconscious mind's going to listen to. You know, fake it till you make it is used in various ways. But in this side of things, there's not a better term because you keep faking it, the subconscious mind's going to believe it. It doesn't know what's real and what's not. So whatever you're feeding it, it's going to latch onto. So as you say there... My life's crap, my life's crap, my life's crap. Well, oh, yeah, no, yeah, I'm all right, but yeah, no, this ain't working, this ain't working. You're feeding it and you're feeding it and you're feeding it. You start feeding, even if it's not happening, you start feeding it yeah. what you want, that's how your mindset's going to go. It's, it's, it's simple, it, well, it isn't simple, but it's simple facts there to say that's proven, that's what it is. Feed it, feed it, feed it, fake it, fake it, fake it, fake it until it's in there. And then that will happen. It doesn't know the difference between real and what's not real. And so you start feeling it, you get into that conscious state more, your life's going to be better. And, you know, I'm big in manifestation as well. It's bound to happen. 
you, you, you know, you can't just sit there and think, well, I want a million pounds on that table. You know, I think quite a common phrase is with the law of attraction sort of thing, the second part of attraction is action. So if you're not doing that, if, you know, it's not just going to turn up. You have to work at it. And I think what you do find, and, and I do believe the universe, it, when you are flying, it will chuck a hurdle in your way. It wants to see if you're prepared to keep doing the things. You're going to keep making that bed. You're going to keep doing these things. You're going to keep challenging yourself every day because, yeah, all of a sudden things are going white and then your car breaks down. And then the washing machine will break down. Oh, I ain't got no money. Just to let you know, that has both happened to me twice in the last 10 days. Wash machine went and my car went. And that's the thing. Now, what happens there? Do you drift back? And you go, oh, my life's crap, and I ain't got no money, or what well, do you see it going, right, okay, how am I going to work around that? How am I going to do That's that? That's exactly what I do. It's going to keep doing it and keep doing it. The universe will challenge you all the time because it wants to see if you're prepared to go, yeah, all right, I'll keep doing it. You give me this path, I'm going to keep going on it, no matter what gets thrown in my way. And that's really where we need to keep pushing ourselves. The uncomfortable is what drives us forward. you know. But again, remember... It doesn't know the difference between real and what's not. It list, the, the subconscious mind is listening to us every word that we pump out. And what you feed it, it's going to help. Yeah, it's very true, mate. Um, another factor as well, I think, is obviously we're in a, a nation now that's very inactive. You're obviously an advocate for health and fitness. You're yeah. in great shape, mate. And you're obviously doing a running challenge, which is, is incredible. How much of a, a link do you think sort of positive mental health and, and physical activity have? Yeah, I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's too easy nowadays for me to hear some antidepressants or, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. I mean, you've got a lot now. You've got, you know, menopause, perimenopause is a huge factor now. You know, drugs are just such an easy way to, to push away with it. I think we all know exercise is probably the best drug you can have. Um, as I say, I think COVID probably had a big effect on now people realising, well, actually, it's quite good to go out to a club and do running or paddle boarding or swimming or whatever. Um, you know, physiologically, we know the effects that it'll have on your body. Um, and as I say, with mine, really, now we've grown to this group of 30. The The way it's been sort of built and built and built, people... People feel awkward to do it, you know. Well, you know, I'll go and have a little look at it. You know, this group operation in Richmond, having it. What they're doing is amazing. You know, they're hitting a target group. It's fantastic what they're doing, and people are gradually going. Well, yeah, I don't want to feel crap for two weeks after going out on a Saturday night. You know, I know me. You know, I've not really drank now in about eighteen months. One or two occasions for birthdays, but. It takes you two weeks to get back. Yeah. You ditch the gym, you ditch the swimming. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you start thinking, oh, God, can we bother? And you're back into that old habit. Again. I think that's why they've nailed it and they've been so successful is because they do fucking really early. Yeah. You know, it Sunday stops mornings, you doing anything. Saturday. You know what I mean? They 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 nail those times where it stops you going out because and you they're cannot good lads. Go you know, they're great lads. They're, jo they're joining me on that last one, and you know they're brilliant people. They're positive, mate. I, I think in Plymouth at the moment there's a lot of positivity. Yeah, there's a lot is, of yeah. people yeah, doing a lot good. of good shit. Yeah, you know what I mean? Well, you, I mean our little group ones on a Wednesday. Yeah. There's groups of five, ten people yeah. running everywhere now. Yeah, you know, people are just doing it. You don't have to be part of an organised. No, yeah. you know, whatever group, the yeah. ones are down and around here. You're making your own little groups up now. Yeah. Um, it's like-minded people, though, isn't it? Wanting to do the same sort of thing. You I think there's a big difference in the youth now. Yeah. You know, particularly in my day, you know, you'd be going out and getting smashed. Mm, same. You know, you'd be yeah, down, you'd be down in the warehouse, you'd be doing, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, what I see more and more now is that sort of younger element is, well, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go pottery classes. Like you were saying, you know, we're going paddleboarding early Sunday morning or, you know, let's get all together and do what they're doing. The, the the change I think in the younger ones now is is, yeah. and again probably maybe from COVID it's it got people out doing different things. You couldn't go out every weekend and get smashed. I think we find it weird at times when I think about it because I I I love some of those years of me just going out on the piss with my mates and doing all that sort of stuff. But realistically, it's a way better lifestyle with, with what they're doing. Way better, you know. Yeah. Like my lad's twelve, nearly you know twelve thirteen, and I can't imagine him 
having that same path as what I had. I've just gone out on the piss and, you know, I was out on the piss at 15. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I was, I was down in Coolaroo. So I can never go Fiesta at 14. It's like... Yeah, you know what I mean? And and I, he's, I know for a fact he's not going to have that life path at all. I, I imagine him more... Like last night, he went up the um, the Howard Foundation gym because they have like teenagers there. Him and his mate went up the gym on their own. Just just went and joined the gym yeah. and he loved it. He was there two hours, went and picked him up and I said, do you enjoy it? He's a sweaty mess. He's like, yeah, I loved it, dad. Yeah, but, it's brilliant to see. But they would never, you know, I would have never done that. I would have never done that at that age. I wouldn't even thought of it. But that's a no social shift, media will have a bit to do with it. You know, lads want to see, you know, yeah, they want to be, yeah. be pumped up now a lot more and girls want to be a certain way and stuff like that but but it's that culture in it of that you know and it and it has its positives and its negatives but i think overall i think it's it's got to be a positive thing and it health and fitness and in, 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 you know looking yeah. after your mental health and yeah. all that type of stuff but yeah it's right across the board i think you know i've seen a couple of programs on tv now you know they are talking about oh well we, we set up a potway class and it's like huh <laughs> what on a saturday night yeah 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 but yeah, it's good. It's good, but do you know? Do you not find it weird though? Again, we're talking about this, and there's. I, th- I think there's a real massive divide. I just couldn't say it's a massive divide of people that seem to be wanting to be either extremely fit or wanting to be really healthy, and then there's the other half who are just really, really out of shape, overweight, don't give a fuck. And I find that a lot. I just I went away to Butlins when I was out at weekends, and the amount of overweight people at that that weekend was just. It, it was mind blowing it was like I was like rocking around in Florida you know what I mean like I was like fucking hell and I've gone every year for 15 years so I know yeah. what it's like and it seems like huge yeah I think I think one of the key differences is mate is, is that a lot of people still don't understand or still don't know that the physical activity impacts your long term health both physically and mentally so much I think you've got people that are aware of that and see the value in it and will take on the challenge and the effort that is required to get out of bed at 7am and go for a run versus those that don't necessarily see the value in it and they're just plodding along and do you think because of food and how sedentary people are becoming that's why the weight gain is so vast i think that's probably it isn't it yeah i think so i think yeah there's there's a food component of what we're eating for sure but i think yeah i think still so many people again we've talked about you know a percentage of people that are out doing amazing things doing physical activity but the majority of of the population I still aren't even achieving the minimum guidance from the government of 150 minutes. That's crazy, though, isn't it? I find that I find that mind blowing. Yeah, I, and like like three quarters aren't achieving that still. And especially, I mean, uh, from secondary school point of view, you know, they're in their rooms now. They're on their phones. Yeah. You know, they're snacking because they're just sat up there, and that's the worry. Mm. You know, this next 10, 15 years of what that generation is going to be like. Yes, we're talking about how youngsters are now starting to change that mindset. A lot of them, but you've also got another group coming That's through. That's what now. I mean. It's, it's a 10, divide, 12, isn't it? 13 at the minute. You know, we're talking about 18, 19, 20 year olds at the minute who have suddenly had that because it's still fairly close from COVID. I think that mindset for them was like, right, my worry is this next one's coming through. I mean, eight year old, you, you know, you see kids with eight yeah. year old now, just whatever, social media or whatever. This eight to say, let's say twelve now. When they start to come through, are they going to carry on doing that? I think because they haven't experienced that sort of COVIDy time of well, you can't go out, you can't do that. So let's join, let's start running, let's start cycling, and yeah. stuff like that. That's where there might be a slight shift again in that next group that come through. Oh, mate, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think another factor is what I think I spoke about recently with uh, one of my clients, but you've also got for the first time maybe in history, you've got like a really broad age range of parents. So you've got parents that are like 40 having their first children. And then you've got parents that are 20 having their first children in the same generation. So what you're seeing is you've got kids being raised by one generation of people that have maybe experienced a more physically active life and a life without social media and see the benefits of not being on it all the time. And then another group in the same generation who are being raised by a, by parents who have only ever been on social media and don't understand the benefits of not and being on And then their children in the same class. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's what you're seeing a bit of a difference as well. That's a great well. point. I never even thought of that. Yeah, because people are having children later. Yeah. 
They are, and then they're not those at forties now. Yeah, I mean, when you know, sort of, you had Jack at what twenty? Twenty three. Yeah, I had my first child at like thirty seven. So there's like a, a big difference. Yeah, that will have a big effect. Yeah. 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 I, I never, I never thought of that. But uh, to your point earlier, just with the with the kids and the bedrooms and stuff, my lad, he's like I said, he went gym yesterday, but. You know, there's definitely times where he's up and he's playing FIFA and all his mates are just up there playing FIFA, you know, fucking ultimate team, this and that. They're obsessed with it. So their their social bonding and group is not going out playing football anymore. He still plays football, you know, but he'll go to his football training on a Tuesday and on a Saturday and that's it. You get what I mean? And they're not going out in the street anymore, kicking a ball around. And he's that's he's that just era. sat there. You know what I mean? And that's the era, you're right, because when he grows up, you know, Jack's never known anything other than his computers and his social media and, and all that type of lifestyle, you know? As and much as COVID was tough for ones that are 18, 19, 20, 21 now from a schooling perspective and educational side of stuff, I think you could look at it and go, well, they got a bit lucky because it forced them out to do mm -hmm. stuff. It, again, are these younger ones now going to see that in them you know, my youngest now, she's going because the oldest one was going. But I think there's far more that you worry that once people probably you would say, let's say 14 now, maybe just downwards, are they going to follow suit? Or is it's it going to go right back that, again now to being bedroom closets? Mm -hmm. and So were that group lucky in one way, unlucky in lots, but unlucky in one way that they were forced to go out and do stuff and then you know, because of social media and stuff it's going to drift back again into being yeah. a nation of I, mean, I think 100 years everyone will just be a slob or be in <laughs> VR AI fucking computers maybe well, again, nights yeah. in the middle of yeah. fucking wherever yeah, yeah we'll see <laughs> Max, you're obviously raising a bit of money with the uh, the running challenge you're doing, mate. Do you want to tell us about that real quick? Yeah, so as I say, yeah, I'll, I'll go off track. I'm known for going off track when no, I ask questions. No, it's bad, mate, or he is at least. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so I was 50 last July, uh, decided to do it. And, um, yeah, we've done 49 last weekend. So it's 50 half marathons in 50 weeks, um, or at 50, really. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we've raised 10,800, I think, just over today. Amazing. So I've kind of switched it. I started at 2,000 as a target. Went to five, obviously went to 10. So that was amazing. I've kind of now thought, well, if we could get to 13,100, um, which is obviously the equivalent of a mar half marathon. So hopefully we've only got that week. It'll probably We've got the Argo reunion right after, so I may try and see if I can... Tap them up. Tap a few of them up if I can. <laughs> But um, yeah, so the 14th of July is going to be the last one. There's talk, obviously, with Operation joining as well. And there could be up to 100 odd people running. We've got friends of mine who have, you know, bringing their kids, some are bringing their dogs, some are walking a lap. It's, it's going to start and finish on Plymouth Hill. I've been doing it all for Devon Mind and for Live Well South West, so, um, which will hopefully go to a lot of the mental health wards down here, and obviously Devon Mind will help them a lot as well. Um, They've been amazing. So Devon Mine are setting up a start and finish blow up, start and finish line and live whatever. I'm just about, she's pestering me because I haven't jumped on it. So we're going to just have a chat later on today. They're going to get a few things set up in there. Hopefully we'll make a full day of it. We're trying to get everybody in yellow. So it'd be like a, you know, yellow submarine going around the city. <laughs> Probably be an early start um, in case the volume's quite big. It's going to be a loop pretty much from Plymouth Hole to the Barbecue and Royal Parade, Royal William Yard, back to the Hole. So it's a five mile loop. Um, and then that last lap obviously will cut it short. So people can join us later. They can walk it and we'll go past them and catch up. And then everyone will meet back on the Hole. Hopefully, uh, I'm speaking to a couple of people to try and carry it on through the day then. The weather will be good so we can have a bit of a day of it. And um, yeah, it, it's. It's been amazing. Uh, the, you know, the donations have been fantastic. Hopefully, you know, we'll have that 2,300 maybe in this next week, 10 days. We can maybe sneak it up a little bit and get close to that figure again. Um, but, yeah, I'm already trying to plan the next one a little bit. Uh, I've been thinking of sort of 26 full marathons in the year or adventures, as I would probably call them, I think. You know, if probably if they're adventures, people will tag along and say, "Well, I'll do five miles with you. I'll mm. do that much." So, 
But again, I'm not a runner. I keep telling people, people saying, you are a runner, you've done this many. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not a runner, I hate it. <laughs> but I've actually grown to love it now, so to speak. When I first do it, it's like, oh God, and the joints kick in and all that. I've been very lucky. I think I fell into the right pair of trainers, which I've changed three times, but I think I've got lucky with them. And the body, for having as many injuries as I used to have, it's been all right. I've not right, really yeah. even had a blister. The calf's got a bit tight at one stage. but So, yeah, that last day could be good. You know, there's people, you know, various different people and a couple of little organisations are saying, you know, we're going to bring people with it as well. Live Well obviously do some promotional stuff, so a lot of their staff and that hopefully might turn up. We've had that on one of the runs. I think uh, the CEO from them came and ran with us around Boatoy and stuff. So we have put a few... Um, One's in Bath, we did the Bath one, we did Bristol one. So there's been quite a few mm -hmm. that we've got in there. And the support from the group of runners I've had with me has been incredible. You know, without them, I'll say it to them every time I've run, without them, I wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. You know, from that first one where, as I say, I was in a different place then. But when I look back and think, you know, I would have had to do another 49 from there on my own every week. You know, there's been once or twice, there's only been a couple of us running, but, you know, they've been amazing. And as I say, we're, we're doing that little Wednesday night thing. We're trying to push a, a Friday night thing, which we we put out there through the winter, uh, neon nights. So, you know, I had the glow sticks and all stuff like that and the music pumping. So we're on about getting that up running. I'm looking at doing one each month, June, July, uh, sorry, July, August, September. Uh, with a band and stuff and music on as we're running and stuff like that so we're, we're going to try and push off on that if we can but yeah the 14th should be a good day and hopefully you know as I say people can turn up they just walk in you know bring the dog walk the kids spend the day up and around that area hopefully the, the weather will be good but yeah you know never mind you know and, and live well they do so much you know they do do so much you know from a live well perspective what the staff do you know right throughout and it's just trying to make people aware of that as well as you know the people that need the help from you know a physical point of view or mental point of view you know the staff for what they do the facilities what they do yeah we can argue and say well this should be done anyway it isn't mm -hmm. you know so from live well's perspective it's going to help them a lot and then obviously never mind it's really going to push them for what they're doing um, but yeah so it should be a good day it should be a good day yeah and if people want to donate or find out more information where can they go mate yeah so you got the Facebook page Paul Maxwell you've got Maxwell Physio that are doing it as well and then it's just giving Paul Maxwell um, if we could get to that 13,100 as I say we were 10 8 at the minute so it would be amazing if we could yeah. amazing if we we'll, could we'll, uh, we'll encourage our audience to donate mate and put the yeah, links below be so hopefully they jump on and board support mate but keep doing what you're doing mate it sounds like some great work yeah it's good as I say and, and if you know we all keep working together we can all feed off each other and this, this is what I was saying about different you know when you if you it's a mindset thing as well if you think someone else is a competition you're not confident in what you're doing yeah. you know everyone should be coming together and, and, and yeah. that's that's what drags people down after time as well. You know, you can be competitive without being angry with it or, you know, jealous or whatever it may be. And that's half the problem. And, and you're right. I think Plymouth is changing on that side. Yeah. There's groups popping up and they're all sort of entangling themselves in together. Yeah, we're seeing that a lot with jiu-jitsu at the moment as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's wicked. Yeah, it's that's true, time, actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot popping up now, isn't it? Yeah. I've always gone craft side. But Foz keeps saying, because I know Darren down there as well. Mm. Yeah. So it's like... Mate, you should come down. I'll whack her. Oh, are you? Yeah, I'll whack her. Well, I'm Steve's, come up, out there. Steve's come up injury-wise a few times. Mm. And Kate... Is Kate still there? No. No, she's left. Kate was coming all the time, obviously, to get hers done. But um, I've known Daz for years, like, as well. Yeah, he, but, said, uh, he said to me, say hello. Yeah, Foz keeps saying to come down sort of thing. And I haven't done... Foz just wants to chin you, mate. That's all it is. I know, mate. Let's get know, down there, strangle the fuck out of you. I know. <laughs> and then you've got, ben, you've got Ben doing that at Pantheon, I think. And yeah, yeah, he's yeah, doing it down one, there. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I haven't done crowd for quite a while now. But I know it's... it's for me, that was... I enjoyed doing that. My daughters went into it a little bit as well. But I, I do keep saying... The problem through all this is I haven't been able to get injured. Yeah. That's after after thing. Mate, right? It can be done very safely, mate. Yeah. The, the the injuries. I, I did a epidemiology study on this for my degree, and the, the injuries in jiu-jitsu versus something like football, mate, is is so low, yeah. so low. And 
and people respect each other, mate, and look after each other. So unless you're a knob on the mats, which I'm sure you wouldn't be, yeah. you know me pretty safe, mate. So yeah, come down. Yeah. I, I teach on a Wednesday night. He's always down there. Right, mate, all right. right. So I'll yeah, be come down, mate. I'll be down. All right, good. But mate, yeah, it sounds amazing what you're doing, mate. So uh, appreciate you coming on, mate, and talking to us. No, I appreciate it. You guys, what you're doing is amazing. You know, again, keep doing what you're doing because it's bringing everybody together, yeah. bringing everyone together. And, you know, the more we can do that, and help each other, the better. But no, you're doing brilliant. Yeah, thank, thank you, mate. Appreciate Cheers. it. See you, buddy.